Uh, as I said, it's great to have Joey Ito, Joey Ito and Mimi Ito here to join us for focusing on this session on interest-based learning. But before including them, just want to give a little update for the online participants in the course. Uh, I think we've been really excited by the activity on the Google Plus community this past week. Uh, I know someone in the community said that uh, watching the Google Plus community for this course had usurped all of their Twitter time this week, but actually they felt it was a good trade-off. So uh, we're happy that we're sort of providing people some new ways of spending their online time. And for those of us here, we found it really interesting seeing all the you know, communication going on by the you know, thousands of online participants. I did just want to mention for the online participants a few things. We still get questions about where to find certain information. I'd encourage people in the left column in the Google Plus community, there's a staff announcements link. And the announcements there are ones that we're providing from MIT. So like, there have been announcements this week. For example, if you want to you know, pose questions to be asked to Joey and Mimi, we gave the information there how to do it. So you should check the staff announcements for information about how to participate actively you know, in the course. Or I put up an announcement just how to deal with the readings. Uh, in the spirit of interest-based learning that we're talking about this week, I encourage people, if you find some readings you're more interested in, dive more deeply, search for other things on related topics. If some things are less interesting to you, it's fine to skim, find the parts that are of greatest interest to you. We put the readings out there to try to capture your interest, uh, but look at it and dive into the things that you find most interesting. Also, the weekly prompts to engage you in discussions in your small groups is also in the left column there. We have the weekly emails are there, so that's another place to look to find out about some of the ways of engaging with your smaller groups. Uh, we also know that some of the small groups have been very active this week. Other groups, there's been less activity. There's some randomness of when we assign people to groups, some groups more active than others. Uh, in the staff announcements, we have some tips of if your group isn't active, how to switch other, to other groups to find other ways to participate. So take a look at those announcements uh, to, if you want to you know, find out more. We've also been really happy how people in the community have been adding new elements to the community. I think we mentioned briefly last week uh, that Adriano in the community had created a Google map of the participants. Here's how it looked. This is, I grabbed it last night. So there's, uh, it really is a pretty global community. We've seen people from all over the world. But in addition to this map of the overall online participation, we've seen some of the individual groups are also setting up just so they can keep track of where people in the small groups are. I liked this one where this was after there were just two markers, one in Boston, one in Peru, but then there was a comment that said, there's two little markers on the map make, me, make the world feel a lot more connected already. Uh, so again, people starting to see how they connect within their groups. We've seen lots of different ways that groups are connecting. I got this photo from a school here you know, in Cambridge, Shady Hill School, where 25 of the educators and administrators all signed up for the course. They're watching together uh, and doing this as part of their ongoing uh, professional development for the educators there. But it's also around the world. Here are some images from Ethiopia, where uh, an educator there, John Iglar, organized the marshmallow challenge that we did, that we talked about last week, and invited some parents and kids both to do the marshmallow challenge and then engaged in reflection upon the different learning styles between the kids and the parents. Uh, but they also went a step further. They took some of the readings from the first week uh, at this session in Ethiopia and made little cutout words and remixed the readings into their own you know, statements about the way they were thinking about learning. So it's been great to see ways people are taking what we're putting out there, remixing, suggesting activities for other people in the online community. Uh, Clearly, it's nice to see that some people are really resonating with the ideas that are in the readings and are being discussed. You know, here was one quote that I grabbed from the community. I just read the reading on formal versus informal education. Joey Ito's experience with formal education is so similar to my own. So it's great that people are resonating and then discussing their own personal experiences. But we also see a lot of people are confronting with the challenges. And there's a lot of discussion in the online community about what they see as challenges. Like, here's a couple ones. Well, here's the one about, here's one that says, I love the whole premise of interest-based learning, but as a public school teacher, I'm struggling with how to integrate this with the Common Core standards. Or one from a parent. From a parent's view, 
I don't see how any schools in my area could incorporate innovative, child-led, interest-based learning when the state is forcing kids into a standards-based box. So people are resonating, but also seeing the challenges. And I think those are things that we want to continue the discussion during the semester, how you know, providing a vision and a better understanding of the vision, but also trying to see how we deal with the challenges and bringing these to light. There's a, reading through the Google Plus community, it was great to see many people responding uh, to the prompt about writing about a childhood object in the spirit of Seymour Papert's gears. And I just grabbed a few of them uh, from Maria, who talked about getting the watercolor kit as, from her childhood in Russia, but then emigrating and bringing it with her as she came to the United States and about her experiences uh, with the watercolor kit. Or uh, Rosa talking about moving as a child from Puerto Rico and then her grandmother in the South Bronx giving her a Nintendo system and how that sort of you know, gave her a new entry point into her new life of, of getting engaged and learning and participation in new ways. Uh, others, like Helen talking about her love of books and creating separate worlds through the books of her childhood. One of my favorite inventions was from Jeff, who, whose parents, uh, he wanted to get a typewriter that he saw in the Sears catalog and you know, his parents wouldn't get it for him, so he invented his own typewriter. Uh, and he says today he now works as a paper engineer, who I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it grows out of this early experience as inventing his own typewriter. And then even the presentation, this beautiful uh, poster collecting a variety of different ideas about uh, uh, Julia's different childhood objects, presenting the roles that different childhood objects you know, played with her. And I think some people did recognize, as in, we saw in this quote, uh, that how rich it is to ask about childhood objects, but to get so much about process uh, Miriam was sharing. And I do think that's one of the things that we most appreciated, although we asked people to share about childhood objects, uh, really what comes out from that is learning about the process of learning and the relationships of learning. And I think we see this, if you go through the community and you see all of these stories, you see so much of it is about the relationships related to learning, the connections that are part of learning, the process of learning. But focusing on objects helps bring a lot of that to light. I think that's another the theme of this course we'll be seeing, of how focusing on the objects and the concrete can open up to the explorations of the networks that people are a part of. So with that as background, I thought it might be a good way to start in talking with Joey and Mimi on the topic of interest-based learning. Uh, in thinking about, and we have here the, the picture of Joey and Mimi, again, thanks for Mimi for sharing this <laughs> lovely photo from their childhood. Uh, maybe to start off by talking to them about you know, objects in their childhood that, that, that interested them, influenced them, and as they look back, what role those objects played you know, in their childhood and, and, and subsequently. And Mimi, do you want to start? Oh, either way, sure. I'm happy to start because uh, I'm going to implicate Joey. It's a little <laughs> bit hard to talk about childhood objects and not implicate your brother in that. Uh, but, you know, I was thinking about, and I love the stories. I looked a little bit online, and I like the image of Gears, but I'm going to go with a uh, girly example, which is just the play with stuffed animals um, that I did when I was a kid. I think that, you know, maybe one kind of childhood remixing and tinkering object that doesn't get enough play because of some of the gender dynamics of these discussions are things like doll play. And for me, I didn't like the plastic uh, girl dolls, but I loved uh, stuffed animals and had a big collection. And we would um, with my friends and I would drag my brother into this to create these huge sort of fantasy narratives and rearrange our living rooms and basements to create these cities that our animals would populate. And I think what's interesting about that is, you know, not just sort of the, you know, the, the obvious sort of fantasy life that was tied to popular culture and other things that uh, kids can get into through doll play, but just all of the social negotiations and, um, you know, the, the uh, politics that go into creating uh, shared narratives together with friends and siblings. So I think that was a huge part of, um, you know, a early learning experience that related to interest in things like uh, character and narrative and popular culture, but also 
uh, in a lot of the interests that ended up animating my um, learning and professional life subsequently, which really had to do with those kinds of um, social negotiations, how culture is built collectively, how you have to navigate these uh, complicated relationships and hierarchies, like which characters are going to have power in this scenario. And um, so I think it was, you know, a really um, formative set of experiences for me that is probably, it, it feels different um, in important ways too, to the idea of, um, you know, tinkering with objects in a more solitary vein. Although in some ways, could you say you were tinkering with relationships? It was still a type of tinkering, but tinkering with relationships? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a tinkering. And kind of as a side effect of it, we would do a lot of construction, right? We would make these forts and you know construct a ton of things. But it was all in the service of story and narrative yeah. and character development and political negotiation. And so the building of things was around that as opposed to you know, building forts for the sake of building forts. So I think that was, um, you know, it's just a, it's a different process. And I think different kids are probably attracted to the building and making through different entry points. Uh, Joey? Yeah, I, I, I kind of struggled because I couldn't <clears throat> remember anything as interesting as gears that fundamentally changed my cognitive models. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just use two different things that kind of, I mean, the, the one object that I really was obsessed with when I was very, very little was, were keys. I collected keys. And to me, that wasn't so much, it was more about a philosophy than a cognitive model because to me, locked doors were things that were, was authority in the way of my getting through things. And keys were the way that I would get, get through it. And it was kind of whether I had to steal the key from my dad or whatever, it was a way for me to hack the system to that was preventing me to ha from having access. Um, it probably is why I like badges and you don't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but, but I, I don't think it really changed the way I th thought about the way the world was constructed. Um, but, Although, stop, I mean, I, I'm really struck when you say, well, there wasn't anything as profound as gears. To me, it does seem profound. Yeah. To, I hear you talking about keys, and I think of Creative Commons, and you know, yeah. that yeah, of yeah. So, wanting so, things so, to be open. Yeah, so, so there definitely is a key, was, it does tie to the openness and wanting access and things like that. But, but the, 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 the other thing that actually wasn't my object, but that I, I remember very clearly was, um, 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 I, I worked at a company that was run by a, 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 a physics chemist genius named Stan Wyszynski, and uh, he was a high school dropout. But he invented the field of amorphous materials, and um, he made the first um, you know, amorphous threshold switch. He was a genius. He had you know, thousands of patents and Nobel laureates as friends. And, and he would have these pipe cleaners and, um, styrof uh, pipe cleaners and um, these styrofoam balls, and he'd sit there and he'd put together molecules and he'd shake them. And he said, see these dangling bonds? I bet if we put germanium there, it would increase the efficiency of the photovoltaics. And then you'd have these Nobel laureates scribbling things down and say, <laughs> well, this is what it means when you write it in math. But he didn't speak in math. He talked about science by shaking these physical objects. And to me, that was actually why I wanted to become a scientist. Because I thought science was about this intuitive understanding of things as if molecules were styrofoam and, 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 and pipe cleaners. And it, that was why university was a, such a big shock, because that wasn't how physics teachers oh. explained things to me. And that was how my mentor had explained things to me, oh. was always physical objects, like the, the ice cream, um, making ice cream, and how, how that he, he explained you know, crystals and things like that. So, so to me, the, the objects of science were how I was learning about science. And then I learned later that that wasn't how it was taught in school. So that, that actually, to me, was very important in my cognitive development because I thought very early on that all science and technology could be explained intuitively through physical models, and that um, understanding that was how you understood science. And I didn't realize that you had to learn it through words and numbers. And, and that was kind of, and I still sort of believe that. you know. Actually, that really resonates for me. I've, in college, I was a physics major, but didn't go on. And what turned me off was, it is, in the early stages, I could have an intuitive grasp of everything we were learning. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got into the later years in being a physics major, I could still manipulate the formulas, and I could still sort of get the quote right answers. 
but I didn't have an intuitive feel, and it lost its appeal to me when it. it but I would kind of blame the teachers because when you watch like the Feynman lectures, and and even if you talk to, uh, you know, and 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 even later in in life, even though I, because I was also a physics major that stopped, but when I would get really frustrated, I remember calling David Adler, who was the head of physics at MIT when I was in high school. I said, my physics teacher can't explain this to me, but I really think this is how relativity works. And he says, yeah, and he would explain it to me in an intuitive way. And I think that unless you really understand it, you can explain it in an intuitive way. And, and what happens is I think we have a, a teaching system where we scale up to a point where the people teaching don't really have an intuitive grasp, so you fall back onto formulae and, and structure. But I, th I think that the people who actually invent new stuff in physics do have an intuitive, whether it's Lisa Randall or whoever, they do kind of have an intuitive model of everything. She may be, Mimi, so this was discussion about, about intuitive ways outside of the classroom and how it sometimes conflicts with inside the classroom. Maybe if you could then move forward from your early childhood experiences to classroom experiences, and again, you were in some different disciplines and different domains, but in what ways did you see sort of that, uh, the connections between your outside of school learning and your inside of school learning, which is obviously a theme in your work today, but I'd be interested as you were growing up, what were the connections for you between outside of school and inside of school? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting growing up with Joey because we were, we are very different learners. So I was always what I call sort of a corporate learner. I did really well in institutionalized instruction and I was what our teachers now call a pleaser, I suppose, in school. And Joey was um, a much more interest-based learner. So in a lot of ways, the research I'm doing now that is focused on interest-based learning, a lot is about my observations of Joey and our differences growing up because we were very close, but we had very different styles of interacting with uh, organizations and developing relationships. And so, um, you know, I think for me, the, the tie was, it, it wasn't so much a conflict between what I was doing in school and out of school, but I think the formative experience uh, for me was just growing up in a bicultural environment where, um, you know, I spent a lot of time sitting outside culture and observing it and trying to understand how it worked. So in a way, I applied that to what was happening in school. Like if in school, if you discover and understand the structure of how what the expectations are, what the achievements are, how you get recognized. It's not that hard to conform if you feel like doing that. So for me, it was always about cracking the social code yeah. and then figuring out what you what to do with it. And I think a lot of, for me, experiences of being a cultural outsider was really formative to that. Now, I think Joey responded to that same set of circumstances in a really different way. But I think at the end of the day, you know, interest can be broader than, you know, what we usually think of as passion based learning, but it can be interest in the sense of relevance to your life. Right. So the thing, you know, for me, understanding culture was about survival growing up. Um, you know, it was, I, it, I had an extreme interest in it because it was highly relevant to what I needed to do to survive as a foreigner in a baffling culture. And we would move back and forth between the U.S. and Japan, so we would get it on both ends. I mean, we never really fit in culturally anywhere. So for me, like becoming an anthropologist and becoming a cultural anthropologist was really built on this uh, formative experience of just... Um, highly relevant and motivated learning, even though it wasn't what you would necessarily consider passion or interest-based in the sense of, you know, music or arts or something like that. But it totally shaped what I ended up doing later in life. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's a really important idea about that interest isn't just something you sort of develop totally on your own. Just, sometimes when we talk about interest-based learning, a misconception I find, and it's often hard to communicate. If we say we want to move away from traditional classrooms, have more interest base, it's as if people think, oh, then just leave the child alone and let them do things on their own so they can develop their interest on their own. And that's not at all you know, what is meant. I, I am, it's weird because I, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, you? sure. So, I mean, because one thing I, I, I wonder, because like I, play was a very important part of my interest. And I didn't think that Mimi had as much play. 
But I'm curious in, in your structure, because but but I do think that also it's it's the time horizon. Like I couldn't think further than you know half a day ahead in terms of my interests. So I just was in pursuit of whatever could immediately feed back. Whereas I think my sister could plan further ahead and say, well, if I want to be there, it's kind of like a chess player. Then I have to do this and this and this. And she could pl plan the moves backwards and say, okay, I need to do this. But the question I have is, was it? Was there any gameplay in that, or was it anxiety driven, or was it much more like a? I'm I'm trying. What what was the emotional component of that that trajectory, the long term trajectory that you had? Uh, well, I think it, a lot of it, it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that I would associate with the affect of necessarily play um, as much as. I mean, there was definitely experimentation and play to some extent, but I think you were much more of a tinker, experimenter, innovator in the moment type learner. Uh, I think for me, it was um, it's about sort of gaming in the sense of optimizing, um, you know, trying to get the it's not necessarily planning in the sense that you know where you're going to end up. But if you have systems, whether it's an organization like a school or a game or anything like that, if it's a fairly rule, these are rule bound systems, right? So you, if you're, if you start understanding, you know, culture and society and how they operate, then you can maximize your, um, you know, your gameplay in those systems. So in that sense, um, you know, even like I do a lot of research on gamers and there's very different styles of gameplay. You know, some gamers really get into sort of these more end game kind of um, forms of playing. Some are much more social and exploratory. And I think there's, even when we talk about play, there's kind of just like with interest-based learning, I think there is sort of this idealized idea notion where you're, the affect is about pleasure and fun and um, exploration. Um, but I think there are other forms of affect that can go with experimentation and inquiry-based learning that don't necessarily have those affective dimensions and that have this, you know, pursuit of um, excellence or um, productivity or um, making contributions to the world, making your your best contribution to a collective. You know, these are these are kind of different affective modes, which again, to Mitch's point, it is about interest. And we've been using the term relevance much more um, in addition to interest, just to signal and to have an openness to different learning styles. So it's not that one is better than the other, but I think that different people, different young people have different kinds of affective registers, different things that drive and motivate them. Some young people are driven by the social, some do have that more individual passion-based thing. Uh, some are driven by play, some are driven by competition. And, you know, all of these things are part of the palette of what can motivate uh, learning, what can uh, motivate young people to make contributions. And I think um, the point of, you know, what we've been trying to pursue, at least with our idea of connected learning and interest-based learning is to really broaden the kinds of entry points, the pathways, the motivations, and the ways we recognize learning so that it can accommodate a more diversity of styles. Is it ever a challenge, sometimes an issue that people raise with interest-based learning, they would say that, well, some interests lead to a better place than other interests. You know, that just, do you want to have sort of equal, val equal value to all different types of interests that people might follow? And how, how does one think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, you know, one of the things that we're really advocating for is recognizing a broader range of interests as possible pathways to learning and opportunity, because a lot of times uh, we make presumptions about what are valuable interests for young people and what are not. And this isn't to say that all interests are equally valuable, but I think our imagination about what kinds of interests 
can lead to productive learning is a little bit impoverished still. So that's why, for example, I advocate for gaming and popular culture uh, as arenas that are really, really rich entry points for interest-driven and valuable learning. Uh, we've seen this, for example, I think there's been such excellent work uh, with hip hop, for example, and uh, you know, the incredible creativity and writing and um, artistic talent that goes into that, uh, you know, those forms of popular culture that have historically been somewhat underappreciated. I think educators have really stepped up to start building more programs around um, spoken word and so on that are tying those forms of creativity and learning into opportunity and recognition. I think we're just starting to see that with gaming uh, and popular fan cultures and things like that. And there's so much opportunity there to reach out to young people who have uh, interests that may not be historically highly valued in our culture. I mean, it's not just piano lessons and violin and chess that make kids creative and smart. There's a ton of things that young people are doing in diverse cultural settings that are underappreciated, underexploited for their learning potential. So we've really been trying to advocate for opening up that imagination. Uh, but yeah, I think also, Mitch, what you're raising is the important issue that, you know, it's it's really important to be open and diverse about what we consider valuable learning, but our, the investments we can make are finite, right, as educators. And so you want to select those games, those forms of popular culture that seem to have the most potential. So, you know, even when I'm uh, looking at young people's um, worlds in gaming uh, or popular culture, we are selecting for our cases and for our educational interventions, ones that seem to have a lot of potential, uh, that seem to have parents and educators starting to um, connect, you know, in gaming, for example, Minecraft is a really uh, great example that is starting to get a lot of traction in education. Uh, you know, there's, uh, we're looking at StarCraft, uh, we're doing a case of WWE. I think that's a underappreciated fandom, this professional wrestling, um, incredibly interesting from a narrative perspective, very family friendly, which a lot of people outside that fandom don't always realize. So I do think we have to pick to some extent, but I think to the degree to which we can broaden in terms of our cultural palette, what we consider valuable forms of interest, it's a big plus in bringing more young people uh, into educational pathways. One thing I was interested in following up on was, you know, Joey earlier raised the question about time scale. And that's another challenging one. There's certain types of things that as much as we can think it's great to have learning on demand, that when you need to learn something, you dive in and learn it. But certain things, if you're going to do a, a piano recital and the night before you say, OK, now I'm going to dive in and learn on demand, it mm -hmm. probably won't work so well. What are ways of dealing with that challenge of knowing that there are different time scales that are needed for different types of things you might want to do? Um, well, I, th I think that, like Mimi's saying, <clears throat> um, there's different things that, uh, like, like, for instance, as a scuba instructor, um, there's a really long time scale before you can become a cave diver. But, it, but I have my scuba diving lessons and badges chunked in basically two or three day courses. So you start out with your license and advance and then rescue and then, you know, and then, and then side mount and then blah, 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 and then mm -hmm. cavern. And, and so, so there, there's, there's a reward all the way up, right? And, 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 and with piano recital, I'm sure you can, yeah, for, yeah. for the short term types. And, and again, I, I really like scuba diving because you have, a, you have a theoretical thing and you say, and tomorrow in the pool or today in the pool, you will use this. And unless you remember Boyle's Law, you're going to drown. But if you don't drown, it's going to be fun because we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And there's always a physical activity, a theoretical component, and a badge associated with each one. And you can literally visualize when that's going to happen. And, and, and that ties into big arc. And I could imagine a piano recital, also you could probably chunk it up. Now some kids don't need it. And so that's why probably we have enough people who are excellent at piano and excellent at going to university who haven't needed the little badges along the way because they can say, oh, in order for me to buy that house, I need to go to this university and get this job. And that's why in kindergarten, I'm going to go to yeah. school every day instead of getting kicked out like me. And so the, um, 
but for, we're losing those kids who are short-sighted. And, and, I, I, and again, I, I don't, it, it's, it's interesting because I, personally, I'm not sure, I think that it's better to be able to plan, but I think I also benefit in certain kind of agility that I get yeah. for not having a plan. Um, but, but to me, it, it, it's this kind of a, a scaffolding that you can create. And again, to, to, to Mimi's, somewhere between what Mimi's saying, what you're saying, because I think Mimi was talking a little bit about the, 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 the culture and the, the medium. Um, and then if you, take about, if, if you think about the tools of reward, like Mimi was mentioning competition and other things, I mean, to me, the, the, the badging is one way, which is, to me, it actually reminds me of collecting keys, right? Yeah. Because I, I collect my little, I have like a whole box full of, of, of patty licenses, and each one enables me to do something, yeah. um, like dive nitrox, and it sort of reminds me of collecting keys. So, that, so that, that's the way I get excited, is when yeah. I collect little cards. Um, but I also know that those are little drivers for me, and for a, a bigger arc. I mean, I do want to become a cave diver, but, but, but it's these little things along the way. Now, I think every person has, has little quirks that, and different ways to do it, and I think that the key is for the parents to tease, tease it out, and also for the, the, the people providing the learning to be able to um, use those things. And, and there's, two, again, two parts to it. I think one is a pathway into the system. So, so if you have a kid on the street who's into video games, how do you get that kid interested in what you would like them to learn? So, so there's a pathway in, to, so for instance, to the Scratch community. And then once they're in, maybe you can get them to change the mode of what's motivating them, and they can become multimodal. So there's a pathway in, but also once they get in, they may still need a different set of things to keep them motivated than um, just the love of learning, that, which is maybe what, what the Scratch community is. And so I would kind of urge an experimentation of, like, because what, what you're going to find, which is interesting, is you, it will increase the diversity, right? So, so what's really fun for me when I'm teaching diving is some of the kids don't care about the badges. They're just in it for exploration, or they're in it because they want to become a cave diver, and they just, OK, forget the badges. Let me just go. But when those people mix, what you find is that different personality types increases diversity, which actually increases their ability to solve problems in interesting ways. But right now, what we're doing is you end up, I'm not going to pick on Harvard, but I will. Um, you end up in a class of, at Harvard where you have a lot of similarities because of what it took to get there tends to be more similar yeah. than, say, a much more random school. And, and, and so their ability to solve problems are going to be diminished at, at, in one way because they're going to have been motivated in a similar way. Yeah. I think that's definitely true in school systems. They privilege certain approaches to learning, which mm -hmm. really does then limit the diversity of approaches that, that come up. I think one thing we do all agree is that having those type of short-term drivers is important. And I think what I think your point is having made different ways of doing it. Actually, we'll be doing a session later in the semester that Natalie will be leading about uh, issues around motivation and persistence and some things in addition to, and different ways of doing it, like different ways of connecting to the community. I think one thing that we often think about is how can we provide new roles within a community that can be that short-term driver. Once I am able to do this, I can participate in the community in different ways. Uh, and for me, maybe that comes to connecting between, Mimi talks about sort of friendship-driven genres and interest-driven genres, and the relationship between those. Because I think we see that, that by, by connecting with the social can really help, re can play an important role of following up on the interest and the way those two things interact. I don't know if you have things you might want to say about the ways that those two genres relate to each other and build on one another. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think that's what, uh, you know, the, the report that I think was offered for this class was really sort of our early observational work on these different genres for how young people were interacting with online environments and games. And then in our current work around connected learning that we're just is a work in progress, we're really trying to understand from based on where young people are engaged. So meeting kids where they are, which is their social lives and their interests, how can you start connecting those engagements to opportunity, uh, you know, career opportunity, civic engagement and educational achievement and building more of those pathways. And I think those pathways need to start with friendships for kids who are really into that you just start with interest for the kids who are more interest driven. And, you know, again, it's about diversifying and expanding those things. I think when we look at really high functioning, more organic uh, learning communities, so not sequestered environments like you see with a lot of classroom settings, that they do embody exactly, um, I think, 
what both um, Mitch, you and Joey are saying, they embody a diversity of motivations, which means that young our people are participating um, in diverse roles and with diverse motivations. Um, there's multiple forms of recognition, so there's not a single standard that people are being assessed on. Incredibly important because if you want a community where everyone thinks they can succeed, there has to be a diversity of forms of recognition. Um, otherwise, the system produces failure. Right. It's a, it's not about picking winners and losers. It's about providing a broad enough range of rules and recognitions that everyone has a place to play and everyone can be recognized. So, you know, I was really interested in studies of Wikipedia, Karim Lakhani's work around these case studies of uh, sites like Topcoder or open source software and in all of these environments where People are coming together to produce incredible forms of knowledge and culture, but also learning really productively together. You do find people who are motivated by the broader mission, you know, create knowledge for the world, that are motivated by learning, that are motivated motivated by social belonging, uh, making a contribution to the group, um, and that are motivated by more what we would think of as the extrinsic piece. Um, financial rewards, getting recognized for in career relevant ways, getting a grade, getting a badge, that actually most high functioning communities of this kind have all of those motivations at play. And I think that social dimension is, is you know, in many ways a bedrock of how uh, these communities function. Actually, I have lots of questions that I'd love to continue to ask Joey and Mimi, but maybe we can take some questions from others. I know Philip has been gathering some of the questions from the online community through the Google Moderator. Do you want to throw one in, uh, Philip? Sure. Um, so we've had a lot of questions about how would you translate these ideas into the formal education environment. And so there's maybe one for, for Joey, asked by Franz from Germany. Um, he says, can you talk about some colleges or universities in the world that are close to your imagination of ideal learning institutions? It's a bit of a softball. <laughs> um, and then one for, one for Mimi, um, uh, which actually there's an interesting discussion even about the question, but it's um, uh, Pat in Springfield asked, one necessary element of connected learning is unstructured time to follow different paths, take chances, figure things out. Patience and unstructured time are, I don't know how to pronounce this, anathema or uh, anathema. anathema to many teachers, parents, administrators, and politicians. How do we fix that? So, so I guess the softball answer is the Media Lab is trying to do this, but it's hard because you know, our faculty need to get tenure or try to get tenure, <laughs> um, and our students gr have to graduate. And by definition, even though our degree program is very flexible, and you can be focused on opera, or you can be focused on synthetic molecular biology. At the end of the day, it's a, it's, you have to do it by yourself. You have to do it in writing at some level, although there's a lot of demos. And, and there's certain rigor around it. And, and what you're still solving for is um, imagine yourself on a mountain all by yourself with no internet and no friends. <laughs> what would you do? You know? And it's such, a, it's such a theoretically impossible thing that you're asking the person to be good at in order to get the stamp. Which is, you know, and it's, it's, it's a decent scaffolding for learning certain things, but ultimately we're not measuring the students at all on how well they collaborate, how, 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 how passionate they were. We kind of do, you know, but, but, but that's not actually what we're supposed to be giving the degree for, right? The, 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 the faculty do it despite the fact that that's not a requirement for graduation. And so, so there's a disconnect between what the university wants us to be measuring and what we as an institution would like to be measuring. And, and to me, that disconnect, and also same for faculty tenure. I mean, I, I wish I could just give faculty, well, I wish that we didn't have tenure, but I wish we could reward faculty for being collaborative. Well, that has nothing to do, really, with the tenure process. So, well, not nothing, but not very little. So, so to me, that's actually a micro thing of a bigger problem, which is the whole idea of higher ed, which is you have jobs, and the jobs require a standardized degree so you know what you're getting so that, that you can fill the standardized job. And that standardized degree has a bunch of assessments. And they all have to do is with what you can do as an individual in the standardized skill or task, 
which drives education. So most kids are in institutions trying to get out of the institution so they get the job because they have the badge, right? Now, now how you hack that inside of formal education is really tricky. The way we're doing it is where we, we've, we've taken the academic program inside of the lab and we basically eliminated classes and kind of, no, wait, we shouldn't say we're yeah. pretending, but, but, we, but in addition to the degree, even though we think it's important, we think it's more important that people have a good time and they have inspiration. But we're only able to do this because the Media Lab was created in a very anomalous structure, which is very hard to duplicate and it's hard to do in any other institution. So, so I don't think we have the solution for a scalable way for other people to do it other than kind of um, re completely reinventing it, which is hard. I'm sorry, that's a negative. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think um, it is interesting to look at sort of these um, very special cases like Media Lab as laboratories. Um, and I think this class is actually a really interesting example of seeing if, you know, how can a formal educational institution, a really high stakes formal educational institution like Media Lab participate in a broader open and more networked ecosystem around learning. So I think experiments like this are you know, one way of testing the waters and how that might look. I think that the question that was raised was a really good one in terms of, you know, this overall issue of how do formal institutions do um, support that more exploratory sort of uh, not, you know, e okay to fail kind of tinkering sort of learning that I think is the topic of this course. Um, you know, when we've when we're talking about the connected learning model, we're talking about three spheres that are need to be in dynamic tension and they need to be have some degree of separation, although we're advocating for connection. One is that high stakes achievement competitive sphere that for young people, it tends to be about schooling. And then when you get older, it tends to be about work, but it is about that competitive achievement, often very individualized, um, high stakes environment. Uh, then there's the sphere of friendships and social belonging, which for kids, it's their friends in school and community as adults. You know, we have a complicated set of relationships with our friends at work, our friends at community and family. But, you know, it is people need communities where they have a sense of social belonging and it isn't about that competitive, individualized achievement piece. And then there's the sphere of interest, which is, you know, the things you're personally passionate about, the things that drive and motivate you, that give you joy in your learning. All of those things need a degree of independence, but ideally there's connections between them. So you don't want the school to start colonizing the friendship space or the interest space necessarily, but you want pathways so that you can start translating and hybridizing and connecting. And that's the delicate balance. So for example, David Buckingham has talked about the unfortunate tendency for the curricularization of everyday life where suddenly, you know, young people's interests and what they're doing at home become subject to the resume building and all of these things that are about getting ahead in your formal achievement. That's definitely not what we're advocating. I think the question embedded in it was saying, you know, what what about these spaces for just messing around and exploring with your friends and doing all of these unstructured informal learning opportunities? Um, should schools be in that business? I don't. I think that schools shouldn't feel like they have to take responsibility for that whole ecosystem. But we've been talking about schools as one node in a young person's learning ecology. And it's a really, really important one for interest discovery. So young people, if you're just subject to what's in your social network or family, there's a limited number of interests that young people can get exposed to. So public institutions like schools museums, libraries play a really important uh, role in exposure to interests. It can be an opportunity to deepen interest, uh, create um, connections to expertise that might not be locally available to young people. And often, you know, schools, we find that that exploratory learning can often exist at the margins of a school environment because schools provide safe spaces for kids in the form of after school kinds of clubs, um, you know, environments like computer labs. Uh, if you have a liberal <laughs> computer lab teacher, mm -hmm. can often be that kind of environment for that exploratory learning. But that's a very different model for saying than saying, 
you know, I think like what the Media Lab is doing and more of the higher education space, that that exploration and tinkering and discovery necessarily has to be fully within school walls. Um, schools can provide points of uh, connection and exposure and um, sort of ref reference building to other yeah. parts of ecosystem without having to take it all on themselves. Yeah. Well, I do think it's easier for people to think about rather than that they have to make this radical shift from one thing to another is the idea that I think both of you have been talking about is multiple pathways. And for all organizations to think about exploring other pathways, as you said, like in a school, opening up spaces, whether it's after school or if places where the, I know some places have done things as the school year lengthens, they say, well, that extra month, let's just do something very, very different with that extra month. Now, it's not exactly the way I would want to do a school if I was starting a, you know, from the beginning, but I do think there's ways that people can start experimenting with multiple pathways you know, within the existing structures that maybe are the, some first steps that could then lead to more dramatic change over time. Yeah, and I think um, you know one example that Katie Salen has developed in the context of the Quest to Learn schools is during most of the school year they do a fairly you know they have to do their standards driven uh, curriculum, but then after every unit they have what they call a boss level because it's a game based school uh, and. Those are these moments when the kids come together and they collaborate and they have to build a Rube Goldberg machine together, or put on a play together, uh, you know, and then suddenly they're working together. Goals are undefined. They're exploring. It's very inquiry based. And then the community shows up to see what they did. So that embodies a lot of those principles of connected learning that we're looking at within the school setting. But it's not something that takes over the entire curriculum necessarily. Um, I think there's also really simple things like remember show and tell, um, you know, invitations for yeah. kids to bring their interests into school, even if they're small ones. I mean, they don't have to be gigantic things, yeah. but just say, oh, school assignments that allow kids to bring the learning they're doing out of school into school or, you know, just something as simple as an opportunity to share. I mean, there, there's lots of things that I think teachers have been doing and can do to open up those connections. Yeah. So let's, is there anyone here in the local group that has a question they want to ask or we could get, sure, go ahead, Paul. There, there, there's a microphone being passed over to you. Great. Um, so um, this question, I guess, well, I'll hit on stuff that Mimi and Joey both talked about, but you were both talking about. Speak up. All right. So, you know, we use this term, the interest-based learning, but I think that, you know, schools do, in a, in a sense, you know, impose interest on us. You have to be interested in this, otherwise you're not going to. And then, you know, we get the Stockholm Syndrome in schools, you know, where people are you know, become you know, inundated with this message that you have to, you have to go this way. And, you know, it does impose interest, I guess. Like, you know, people come up with all sorts of nonsense reasons why they care about history in high school. Um, but I th what you, one thing that you were talking about that really resonated was about intuitive learning. You know, things that, you know, we were able to incorporate into an existing mental framework that we're able to, you know, and I think um, that in, in a way we were actually talking about that in the online discussions and now about interest not as, you know, we're just interested in it, but also like it applies to us, it helps us build our mental frameworks, which I think was um, in the Gears of My Childhood essay about that. And, you know, perhaps you could um, talk, talk a bit about how like intuition plays a role. So, so <clears throat> I'm gonna take your question and twist it a little bit. <clears throat> I think about the difference in people's cognitive models and how I think that affects what you're interested in, how you learn, because it ties to the gears thing. I mean, I think <clears throat> that um, when I was little, I just didn't like disciplines. I, I, I wanted to create one big model of the world, and I was really into grand theory. So, so I didn't like having a math class and a physics class and a history class. I wanted to understand why this history lesson had something to do. How would it, what does it mean for my physics model? And, and it took me a lot longer to become smart. Like I had bad grades, I didn't get stuff because I didn't want to build a, a history model and a social science model and stuff like that. I think in, and, and this is why I needed to learn things intuitively was I wanted to translate what was going on in the teacher's mind and adapt it to my own kludge together Joey's customized version of a cognitive model. In later years, and I'm just making this up, this may or may not be true, but I think that now I 
have an ability to connect things together better because now I only have one cognitive model. So when I hear a history talk, I can talk about the relevance to my physics researcher because I can translate it through my model because I map it onto a single model. Whereas I find where somebody is in a discipline, it's very difficult for two disciplines to talk to each other because their cognitive models actually don't have a hard time connecting because the patterns are so different. And, and so, so for me, it, it took me longer to build this funky thing. And, and partially it was what Mimi was saying was being um, bicultural. I, I didn't want to build a separate America model and a separate Japan model. I was trying to pull them together and create a single bicultural model. And, 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 and I don't know if you call it a cognitive model, but it's, it's kind of a worldview thing. Um, whereas I think some people can, can be quite structured and have, have the disciplines, but then have the way to connect those blocks together in kind of a meta structure. So you, you can go through the world, the life and build a pyramid and then come up with profound thoughts. But my brain was just not structured in a way that it could be structured. It was just kind of this chaotic thing that was coming out of this need to be able to understand things intuitively and translate them in my own way. And, and part of it, I think, came from, like, like I, I realized like I didn't think in words. I didn't think in numbers. I, 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 th I thought in kind of forces. So everything felt kind of physical. That's why these dangling bonds and, and keys, there were always these little physical metaphors. And I always had to map it into that. And it was difficult because the teachers didn't explain things to me and those sorts of things. Um, so I think part of it is like, what, what is the, the media form that's good for you? How do you store it? How do you think about it? And how do you translate it out? Determines what sorts of th things, and, and to use the word inspiration, I mean, it, it is the interest because you can find a lecture interesting to you if it fits a model that you can understand. But if it, but if it, does, it's, if it seems irrelevant to you, you're not interested. So this is a slightly different use of the word interest. But I think what you find interesting depends a little bit on the cognitive model that you're building. I, I don't, and, and I think that Mimi and I had very different ways of processing and storing and, 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 and collecting that information. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're pointing to is um, you know, something that I think learning scientists have recognized and we're, there's more and more good research on is the fact that when uh, learning is embedded within an experiential hands-on and relevant real world frame, uh, it's much more resilient and effective and motivating. Um, it's not surprising, right? I mean, talking about intuitive, <laughs> you know, it's not surprising that learning's more fun when it's relevant and experiential. So. Um, you know, and I think that there's a small number of people who, um, you know, and I may be one of them it, who have that more formal academic orientation to learning where a certain level of abstraction is actually the cognitive model that works. And, you know, my colleague Howard Gardner has given me this language about lumpers and splitters, you know, people who like to make distinctions and categorize. And it's a particular kind of versus people who are always drawing connections. And, you know, it's a particular kind of mindset, I think, which is very, very valuable for school based learning and has served me well within the formal academic environment is, you know, being able to think in a fairly formal structured way. I don't think that is necessarily um, experiential or natural for everybody. Uh, and I think school rewards, um, you know, those, you know, people who can compartmentalize and divide things up in that way. Uh, but, you know, we know from working with young people that that's not motivating <laughs> for a lot of kids. Uh, to learn in that way. And, you know, even for those of us who are more academic and formal thinkers, when we can apply those frameworks and those disciplines to things that are relevant to our real lives, it becomes so much more interesting. Uh, and, you know, the only reason why I've stayed in academia is because I've been able to build those connections to things that are meaningful in my real life. And so, you know, the question to me is not... Um, so much how can we change schools and classrooms, but really, you know, how can we um, bring them into the world um, in ways that are building on experience? And I think the best forms of uh, learning and instruction are already doing that. Hey, 
I want to interject uh, the idea of technology into here, which we actually haven't been talking about very much. But for me, at least, when we talk about learning from experience, these are relatively old ideas. John Dewey was writing about these ideas 100 years ago. For me, I'd like to think that one of the challenges with Dewey's progressive schools is that the only certain, there's a limited range of things you can do from experience. If you have a set of things that you think it's important for people to engage, ideas to engage with, things for people to know, uh, with traditional media, there might be some things that you can easily investigate through experience, but other things are very difficult, especially things that are dynamic and interactive. If all you have are crayons and, and wooden blocks, it's hard to do it in an experiential way. So I think the hope would be that technologies could open up and give a greater chance to support more experiential approaches to a greater range of learning experiences. I don't know if either of you have anything to, to say about that. Well, I, I'll just use the, the World of Warcraft as an example. I mean, I, I think if you have a five-year-old running, leading a raid over TeamSpeak or wherever of, you know, 40 adults, and to use John C. Lee Brown's word, I mean, and you hit that moment of ensemble where everything comes together and you take down the boss and everybody cheers, um, that's a real experience of leadership that a five-year-old or an eight-year-old would never get. Yep. Um, is not only with cranes and blocks at yep. school, right? Yep. And yep. so, 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 and, and that's a tremendously important experience to have early because you start to understand what real leadership is about and how it's an emergent thing and how you and, and about meritocracy. So, so I think the social component of experience yep. is tremendously em enabled, and 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 also the the other part is just to be able to cr be a creator, right? So, so good science and te technology right now is stuff that you can hack. Right? And, and I think that we've gone through a whole period where, as a kid, in the old days, you, used to be, you could hack bugs and plants and you know, nature. You couldn't hack all the toys that you had and the wooden blocks and the crayons, but now you can hack stuff. And so I think it's, it's the social component, it's the, the hacking component, and then the ability to learn on your own without, without, without this formal instruction. I mean, you could do this again with wooden blocks, but, but I think it's tremendously empowering to be able to do that as a child because then you become, you know, you become fearless at that level. Do you have yeah, no, I would totally agree that it's sort of the hackability, remixability component, the social, the abundance of social connection, right, and the low barriers to entry for a lot of interest activities that the internet provides. Um, I would just add one more, which is the tremendous diversification of access to interests that young people have at an early age. So like, um, you know, the previous comment, it's like, you don't just have to do piano, math, history, you know, that there's sort of a limited number of interests that most local communities can provide in their learning interest in community um, environments. And the internet just blows that wide open. So it, you don't have to do football, baseball, basketball. Suddenly you have badminton and you have surfing. It's like, it's as if you know, for knowledge and um, interest-based things, you suddenly have access to a ton of interests that are not offered necessarily within your school. And that is um, a huge game changer because I think the number of, it's just, um, you know, physically impossible for play, purely place-based institutions to offer that kind of diversity and specialization. Yeah. No, I think that that's great. And I do think maybe that's a good note for us to end on, was this idea of just opening up these wider range, connecting to a much wider range of interests. So if, if the session's on about interest-based learning, there's opportunity to be able to support and connect to this much wider range of interests and to connect with other people with those interests or, I, or, or other types of information that can support resources to help you develop those interests. I think it's sort of a key to having a, a, a renaissance in interest-based learning. Uh, Although it's not a new idea, I think we're now you know, in a place where we can have a real renaissance in it. So maybe we could, we'll wrap up today, but let me give a, before signing off, give a quick look ahead for next week. Uh, next week we'll be you know, focused on the theme of constructionism and making. And again, we'll have two visitors again next week. Uh, Dale Doherty, who is the founder and editor of Make Magazine and a uh, you know, key figure in the maker movement. And also Leah Beakley, professor here at the Media Lab, who has also been a key contributor to the maker movement, especially in terms of broadening participation to get everyone engaged in making. Uh, as part of the hands-on activity for next week, we'll be having a first experience with our Scratch software. Uh, if you look online, we'll 
put up a, 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 some videos and some explanations of what we're looking for you to do. We'll be hoping for everybody to make a scratch project where you share some things that you enjoy doing uh, to, to share that. But we'll have more information online about that. So check out the Google Plus community for that. So again, really like to thank Joey Ito, Mimi Ito you know, for coming. And we'll see the rest of you next week in Learning Creative Learning. So thanks again.